we are ready to start with the next presentation in our main hall. I hope you guys still have some energy for some deep and complicated stuff because that's exactly what our next presenter is going to talk to you about. It's about evolving microservice architecture, especially when you have a lot of them and you need to scale out across the board, vertically, horizontally. So, telling you about this complicated map, as you'll see in a moment, is uh, Nikolai Stuitsev, an engineering manager from Uber. So, please give him a round of applause. Hello, everybody. I'm Nikki, and today I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, evolving big microservice architectures. And I want to start with a simple question. How many of you know what microservices are? OK, everybody. Otherwise, it was going to be a very strange topic. talk. Um, OK, how many of you work with microservices in production? A show of hands. OK, how many of you work with more than 100 services in production? Two, three, five, OK. 1,000 services in production? OK. Uh, this is this is, this is the microservice architecture that uh, my team is working with every day. Um, it's very big, and uh, at the end of the talk, uh, you're going to learn some uh, approaches, some engineering solutions uh, that can help you easily understand such a complex architecture and be able to introduce new functionality in it, uh, refactor it, or evolve it the way you want. And uh, first, I'm going to start with a little bit of background. When Uber started working, we didn't, the first day we came up with 4,000 services. No. Everything started with a simple application <coughs> that looked like this. Um, this is the first version of Uber, and you can just request a black car. You press, press a button, and a black car comes to you, and you get in, and you get, get somewhere. Really magical. And it was a uh, yeah, simple architecture, like there were two components. The first component was a dispatch system that was uh, communicating with the mobile clients and basically doing the pairing of riders together, dispatching drivers, basically the real-time stuff that needs to happen when you request a car. And then there was another component that was the API. It was one thing, and it was, yeah, all the back-end business logic was, was there. Um, and it was a monolith, right? And the monolith is a nice thing because um, we, we had like 500 engineers contributing to this one component called the API. And it was uh, very interesting to work on a big monolith. The code was consistently good because there, was, there were a lot of people looking at it, a lot of people refactoring code. The code in this monolith was really nice. Um, it was very easy to, to reuse code. Uh, you just say import from, and you put the package name, and you reuse the code. It's that simple. You don't need to, to do some complex stuff, and everything was well tested. When you have such a big piece of code that is so critical, and it's running your company, you write test for it, and everything was well tested. But it was, it was hard to deploy, this one monolith. Why was it was hard to deploy? Imagine that yourself in a role of a person that needs to deploy this single big monolith. And many people committed their code in the master. And you have like uh, five commits that are there, and you, you need to deploy them. You, you don't understand what the code does. You don't understand uh, what it's doing, what is the impact. So it's a very tough job, right? If you just pick um, all of the, yeah. You don't know the risk, you don't know the priority, what, what is going to happen if you just deploy the third and the fifth or the second and the fourth, you don't know. Um, and you put all the commits into the same build and the build breaks, you don't know what happened, what, what happened, you know. Uh, it's very hard to, to understand. But it's a solvable problem. And, and it's a very e easy solution. You just ask the engineers to tuck um, their commits with how risky they are. And then when you need to deploy this monolith, you just pick the one that you like. So you pick one low risk, you may pick one medium risk, and one high risk, and, and that's it. And you also can tag it with, uh, yeah, you, you do your build, and then you use the continuous integration, continuous delivery to run the test and deploy it in production. So uh, also, yeah, so 
the deployment is a problem that you can solve easily. And it's very important to roll it out gradually. Your continuous integration system should roll out first 5% in one data center, 5% in another data center, 10% in first, 10% in the second. And uh, that way you can safely create your build. You know which commits to pick. You can safely roll it out. Um, so yeah, lesson to learn for me is that the monolith can scale a lot. So the first thing that I wanted to start with is we're going to talk about how to evolve big microservice architectures, but uh, don't go there unless you need to. It, yeah, because there's a lot of complexity as, as we're going to see, and monolith works just fine. And yeah, if we go back to, go back to the architecture, um, yeah, this is, this is from where Uber started. There was a dispatch service, the API service, and uh, yeah, we, we decided that, hey, it's time to split it up in microservices. And the first step was just to split it in components. Because if you have one tightly coupled monolith, if you transform it in microservices, you're going to end up with spaghetti microservice architecture, which is bad. So first, it separate the components so you can have clear separated things that you're going to move to microservices. And then you start moving the components in microservices, yeah, one by one. And this is the time when I joined Tuber. So that there was this API component, and we were separating it out from uh, to different monoliths. And when I joined, everybody proud themselves by how many lines of code they deleted from the API, from this one service. It was like the best thing when you delete code from there and you put it in your microservice. Um, <clears throat> and back in the time when I joined, it, there, were, there was only writes service, so the, the service that we all know, where you just press a button, a camp car, so you get in and you go somewhere. But as the time progressed and as the business evolved and the business grew, now there are a lot of things that you can do on the Uber platform. You can order food, you can get a bike, um, you can order a truck. There's, yeah, you can, yeah, everything. You can do a lot of things on the Uber platform. And now Uber is this platform that allows you to move stuff in the, in the real world. And, uh, but not only the complexity grew with all these new uh, fancy use cases that, that we were supporting, but also the volume grew. And this is how we end up with those 4,000 microservices. It was gradually, and yeah, it comes from the complexity of the business and from the scale of the business. And yeah, there are yeah, more than 4,000 mic microservices. We have more microservices than engineers. <laughs> And the, the interesting thing is that there, there are 1, 000, more than 1,000 deploy, deploys every day. So one-fourth of the system changes every day, which is, yeah, big system that changes constantly. And yeah, the goal of this talk is to see how to evolve such an architecture. So uh, we're going to get a very, very simple hypothetical architecture, uh, picture of how the architecture looks like. And yeah, here is how it looks like. There is a dispatch service that talks to the mobile phones, uh, pair people together where they, when they want to get a ride or um, dispatches orders to restaurants or dispatches orders to uh, trucks. Yeah, this is the system that communicates with the mobile devices. Then there is a set of services called uh, trips services that store trips. You can, get, you can say, give me the trips for this user, uh, record a trip, uh, etc. Everything related to the trips that happens on Uber. There's a pricing services that uh, when you ask, ask the pricing services, tell me the price of something, the pricing services tell you what is the price. It's very intuitive by the name. Um, then there is a hypothetical task calculation service. And you might wonder yourself, well, why do we need a service? I mean, in Bulgaria, the, we know how much the VAT is. It's 20%, so you just multiply the number by 0 0.2 and you get the VAT. Why do you need a whole service? But not everywhere around the world, um, the, the VAT, the taxes are flat. In some countries, it's very complex. For example, if you, had, if you order food and uh, somebody gets the food and warm it up for you, there's one tax that's applied to this food. And if they don't warm it up, there's another tax. And if you order something and you order a soda drink, there is one tax. But if you don't order a soda drink, that's another tax. Uh, so it's very hard to module all the tax rules around the world in if statements, so you need a service, you need a 
rules engine that, tell, that tells you what the tax is. There's also a vehicle store that stores like uh, the vehicle, the, the color, the brand, the, yeah, everything that you need to know about the vehicle. And there is a payment service that you'll never guess what it does, most money. <laughs> and then there's a receipt service. Every time when we charge somebody, we, need to send, we want to send them a receipt for, for the charge. So this is the hypothetical architecture. It's very simple. And um, today we're going to try to introduce a new use case in this architecture. And the use case that we're going to try to introduce is called Uber Elevate. And this is this uh, service that allows you to share air transport. Basically, you get a car that flies, and yeah, you pair up with people, and you fly somewhere instead of driving there. And yeah, this is something that is going to exist in a couple of, of years. And uh, yeah, the vehicles looks very different than cars. Here is how one such a vehicle looks like, and it's called a VTOL, vertical takeoff and landing. And yeah, it's like a new, a new use case. And imagine that we are the engineers that needs to introduce this new service in, in Uber, basically to, to support it. This is the architecture that we need to, that we, that we currently have, and let's see uh, what are the steps that we need to go through. So task number one, we need to change the dispatch service because pairing people for air transport is a little bit different than from everything else because there is a time schedule, a different number of people can be paired into a veto. We need to do some code changes there. Um, then we look at the user's, user's service, and it's OK. A uh, person who takes a ride is not that different from a person who takes a flying car. Um, then we're looking for our pricing service. The pricing for air transport is a little bit different than from everything else. For example, time and distance should be fixed, so it's not like playing a role. We need to change our pricing service. In the tax calculation service, we need to set up new taxes, so a code change there. The vehicle service cannot store uh, VTOLs out of the box, so there is a change there. Trip service, we also need to change it because it's not easy to store, store uh, flights there. The payment system moves money around, so we don't need to change it. And then the receipt service, we want to change the icon that the people see on their receipt to be of a flying car and not of a car. So as we can see, even with small number of services, if we try to introduce a new use case, it's like a lot of things that we need to do. And yeah, this is the question that we're going to answer. How to evolve big architecture? Because you see with um, eight services, we have six things to change. And how about when you have 4,000 services? And the first problem that we need to solve is um, that you cannot change something that you cannot test, right? You cannot just make changes at hopes that it's going to work. You need to be able to test it. And the first thing that we're going to think about is, OK, Let's, let's set up a staging environment. How many of you use staging environment to test their stuff? Okay, nice. So everybody, <laughs> almost everybody. Okay, but in, in the world where you have a big distributed system, if you don't change your code in this distributed system environment, you don't know, basically you haven't tested anything. You don't know how it behaves. This means that your, for this case, the staging environment should uh, have some traffic flow in it, flowing in it that is almost equal to the production traffic, which means that we need to replicate all, all 4,000 services to duplicate them twice, um, which means that almost two identical environments need to exist production environments, which means that double the cost of the hardware that we use, which is like a lot of money. <laughs> and it's very hard to build and maintain such a staging environment. So yeah, it's not always a solution. <clears throat> Then we go to the next approach. How about integration tests? Can we just write some tests and we're going to test it in production, right? Yeah, we can write some tests. We can do it. Um, but how about the data? We need some test data to, to test with, right? Um, and let, let's see one example. If you want to change the dispatch service, the first task that we defined, um, basically, you don't want to make changes in production with real, with real users, right? If you use a real user, they need to have a real credit card, and then a real charge is, go is going to happen on their credit card. 
And if you just start, start tracing this stuff, it then you, you, you see that you need to mock a lot of data in a lot of services. And for each of these services, you need to go, for example, to the user's team and tell them, hey, I want to create a test user, but I want to use it just for testing, how to avoid all the side effects. And then you go to the vehicle service and say, hey, I see that when I register a new vehicle in the vehicle service, it starts a process to do a vehicle inspection, for example, how to avoid that. And it's like really tough to do it. And then you need to, to start tracing, okay, which are, which are the consumers of vehicle data information, you need to go to them, and then their consumers, and their consumers. And it, in a big uh, microservice architecture, it's very hard to do it. Um, you need to, do, to mock a lot of data. And uh, yeah, it's very hard to do it. The only way to, and the, the fastest way to do it is just to use the system in production to create your test data. And uh, this is what is called multi-tenancy. And uh, yeah, multi-tenancy, what, what it is. First, to, in order to understand what multi-tenancy is, let's see what a tenant is. Basically, a tenant is a user that uses our system. But in this context, you can imagine that a tenant is a group of traffic that runs on, on our machine, uh, in our system. And it's isolated, so one set of data cannot access another set of data. It, yeah, basically they're isolated. Um, we can think of uh, traffic that's labeled with colors. And if we had a red color traffic and purple color traffic, if we get a user that's associated with a red tag, it cannot be associated with, that, with data that is with purple tag. So only red tag users can access red tag trips and purple tag users can also only access purple tag trips. Yeah, basically you can imagine as colors on the data and you can, yeah, it's like they're isolated, they're running in separate environments. And yeah, the most popular tenancies that exist are two. You have your production tenancy, and then you have your testing tenancy. When you design your system in a way to support such multi-tenancies, you can treat each tenancy in a different way. This means that you no longer have to mock data. You can write data easily to a service when you say, this is a test tenancy data. And every service out there, if it's a multi-tenant, it, know, it knows how to handle it. For example, the vehicle service, when you try to create a test vehicle in your vehicle service, it is going to say, oh, this is test data, so I don't need to trigger the vehicle inspection flow, for example. And then your user story will be, oh, it's test user, so uh, we allow test credit cards and not real ones. And yeah, you just write traffic. When you write it with test tenancy, it's very easy to write it all over the place. You need to build your services to support uh, such, a con such a configuration and basically work with test tenancy. And there are different types of tenancy that you can have. The other type of tenancy is an uh, audit tenancy. Uh, this is, again, another label that you can put on your traffic and treat it in a different way. And audit tenancy, you can think about it as uh, the immune system of your, of your system. When something happens, the audit tenancy traffic can, can detect in production that something is off. And the way you do it, you just inject traffic that's like audit tenancy traffic then you can put checks in each of the services. And you know that when you get audit tenancy trip um, type three, you know what uh, should happen and you can put invariants in your code to always test that the invariant of uh, the thing that you're audit auditing is working and it's always true. Yeah, so yeah, it's really helpful. When something breaks on a business logic level, you can very easily uh, detect it with and yeah, you, you can do it to run constantly. It happen, happen all the time. And okay, now we can mock data and we can do the changes, right? But there are still um, a lot of changes that we need to do, right? A lot of code. And, and why is that? Why do we need to change uh, so many stuff? In order to avoid changing uh, so many microservices, we're going to introduce the concept of a platform. And uh, why do we need a platform? We need a platform because currently the services that we have are too specific. They're, they're designed for one use case, which is ride sharing, and uh, they don't support abstraction. 
And yeah, they don't support new, new use cases. If you want to store something different or process something different, it just doesn't work. It's not designed to do it. So our service, in order to be able to evolve them easily, our services need to support abstraction. They need to be able to work with uh, different data models, with different use cases. And the best example for this, in my, my opinion, is AWS. So if you look at AWS, you don't, you don't have, for example, um, service for storing product images, and then service for storing uh, people's avatars, and then service for storing some other type of images. No, right? You have one service that's called S3, and you can store every static resource in it. It's not designed for a particular use case. It's just this abstract thing that just can store binary, binary data, and that's what it does. And when you design your ser services in such a way, it's uh, very easy to reuse them for different uh, cases. For example, S3, you can serve, use it for different types of use cases that you need to, to serve. And um, let's look, look at our trip service, for example. Right now, it's designed just to store trips, right? Um, and the, flight, the trips that are involving flight are a little bit different, and then when you have Uber Eats order, it's a little bit different, and there is also three parties involved in it. Somebody bringing the food, a restaurant, an eater. Um, it's not that trivial. Uh, so what you need to do in this case is think about, okay, let's think about an abstraction that will be able to represent everything that happens in, in my platform, all the current cases and the, the future use cases. It looks like that the abstraction of a trip is not enough, so um, we get together, we think about it, and we say, okay, let's, let's uh, make it more abstract. And instead of uh, having a service for storing trips, let's have a platform that stores orders. An order can represent everything, um, and we designed it in a way that, yeah, it basically can support new use cases, and it's a lot more extensible. And then we do... We do the same with every other system. It, and it's not only about the way uh, how we design our software internally, but it's also about what tools we build. And if we look at the tax, tax calculation engine, we don't want to um, having engineers making changes and introducing new rules. We want to build a self-service tool, a UI, when somebody who knows taxes can go there and configure their taxes. And same, same, for, same for receipts. We want to have some UI where people can go and replace the image by themselves and preview how the change looks like and deploy it in production. Um, you don't want to build a receipt service that only engineers can change. And um, yeah, it's very hard. In order to do it, this is a very hard uh, shift in the mentality in the way you design services and the way you operate them and extend them. And it's not only about renaming. If you just get your service and you rename it to platform, this doesn't work. It, it doesn't count. You need to shift the way that you think about your service, the way that you design it, the way that you build tools around it. And it may require a, um, to start a solution from the ground up. It may require tricking it just a little bit, and it becomes this abstract thing that is serving a lot of use cases. But again, it's very hard shifting mentality. And the best way to go around this, in my opinion, is to answer the question, can you sell your service outside of the company? For example, if you're working on a receipt service, can you build it in a way in order to be able to sell it to somebody else to make their receipts with, with the service that you're building? And this is the, the, yeah, the principle that I use when we design something, if we right now we get, we get it and we try to sell it outside of the company, are, is there going to be another team that likes the solution and uses it to solve their use case? And when you start thinking about it, you change the way that you design your software, the way you run it, and some things that we uh, often ignore, like writing documentation, um, helping the tool to be more uh, intuitive for users, these things become important, and we start to pay attention. So yeah, basically, can you sell your, your thing outside of the company? 
And uh, when we build our services with such a mentality, we end up with uh, platforms that can support uh, more use cases. And let's say that, yeah, we refactored our task, task calculation engine, our payment system is now something that we can sell outside. And yeah, it's like, it can support different use cases. And same, same for the pricing engine, it's abstract. It can price different use cases, new use cases, everything that we throw at it. But there is one slight problem. And it's like in, in the details. <laughs> In order to calculate taxes, you need to call the service by asking it with double, with um, numbers with double precision, basically double numbers. When you try to call the, but when you call the payment system, you cannot ask it to char charge 3.14159, right? Because there are no such money. You can only charge what currency you have. So you need to call it with two digits. Um, and then when you call the pricing engine, the engineers in the pricing engine said, uh, well, the double numbers are not that precise, so we're going to have integers with precision. And when you end up with such cases, there are three platforms that can serve different use cases, but it's very hard to integrate one another, right? You always need to have one layer that transfers the, the digits in the correct way in order for, to plug it in all other services which is another problem that you can have in a big microservice architecture. And the way to go around this problem is by having a common data model. And the common data model allows you uh, to incorporate more easily things together. And what do I mean by a common data model? Uh, for example, everywhere in your system, no matter where, to represent the currency in the same way. And yeah, this is one way to do it. And when you have common definition between all services how to represent currency. It's very easy, easily to get a library that's rounding numbers and you use it all over the place, right? It's very easy to, um, every engineer in the company knows how, if they need to change some other service, they know how the currency is represented there. And you can apply to different uh, use cases, for example, to locale, when you have a common definition of what a local is. You can have a common infrastructure for localizations, for translations, for international, internationalization. And a very fresh example from today, uh, I read that uh, Brazil, last summer, they decided to stop their day daylight saving time. They're no longer going to switch the, to daylight saving and then back. And today is like the first day when the time is not going to change, right? And if you have a code in production that is working with time zones and you haven't updated your uh, time zones library in the past six months, which most probably you don't update your localization library that often, your time in Brazil right now is wrong. <laughs> so a lot, of, a lot of people need uh, had to run around this morning and just check, oh, this is implemented in Python and it uses this library, let's change it here. And then there's another language, let's change it there. Um, yeah, and if you have a common infrastructure for doing this, you need to change it only in one place. And yeah, if all the services are using it, then it's very hard to use it. But you cannot express everything with a common definition, right? Because for example, a car is very different from a veto, from the things that's flying. And in order to support uh, flexible data model, we need to support uh, something that's called data extensions. And this is a very popular approach when you define schemas for something. And a data extension is a place where you can define two things. The first thing is the schema for reading the data, and the second thing is the data itself. So every place in your code where you want to store the vehicle that's there, if you just uh, put a strict schema, here is how a vehicle looks like, when the next use case comes, you need to change it all over the place. This is something that you don't want to do. Every place where you want to define a vehicle, you just say, well, this is the schema for decoding this vehicle, and this is the payload, and you can get the schema and decode your payload. Basically, yeah, and you need the schema because, yeah, you need, need uh, this common understanding of what the data model is. And basically, how to do it, how to have a common data model in your 4,000 microservices, um, there are a lot of, a lot of yeah, ways to do it. 
The first way is just to have a schema service. This is the service that stores your schema. When I ask it, when I ask the service, give me, give me the schema for car, it gives you a car. Give me the schema for currency amount, it gives you currency amount. Give me a schema for veto, it gives you the schema. So it's like this service that just returns schema data and you can write your schema there. You can do it with a simple git repo. So you commit all the schemas in the same repo and then every service just clones the git repo locally and they read the definitions from there. You can put all the schemas in a library and then use this library in all, in all your services. So there's a lot, a lot of ways to do it. But uh, if you don't do it, we again risk the having uh, different data across our system and this makes our platforms not that useful. And okay, we have, we have the, the solution that we need, right? We built our services like platforms. We have, um, we can test them. There's a common data model. You can easily interconnect platforms together. But there is thing, still one thing that we need to solve. There is still business logic that needs to live somewhere, right? There are something specific that is only relative to flights, to elevate, that needs to live somewhere. There's this piece of code that we need to put somewhere and we can start and looking around uh, where to put it. We talk to one team, they say us, well, this is the, the place to put it. Then we talk to another team, they say, well, you should put it here. And uh, things can become re really messy. If you don't have a common, common understanding what, where it should go where, it's very easy to make a mess. Um, because yeah, everybody needs to make their own decision what should go there and then th things can become really messy. You can, in one place, you can put things with many different concerns and many different uh, yeah, types of, uh, yeah, basically, use cases. So we end up with spaghetti code. And how do we, yeah, uh, yeah. How do we code, uh, how do we call a code that's like mixing business logic and everything on one place? Code spaghetti code, I already said it. <laughs> Yeah, we end up with something like spaghetti codes. In our services, uh, people make different decisions, everything is tied together, everything is like uh, very mess messed up on one place. And uh, how do we fix, fix the problem? We fix spaghetti code with separation of concerns, right? We know, we define the concerns, we're saying these are the things that should happen in our system, and then we say these things go there, these things go there. And we know it, I mean, every engineer have worked with um, <coughs> three-layered ar architectures, and we know how they work, right? You have a very clear separation of what should go where. If I want to add a new page in this application that shows, uh, that displays a screen uh, with flights, I know where to put it. It should go in the presentation layer. If I need to change a query or the data model definition that is how uh, flying vehicles are stored in the database, I need to put it in the data layer, right? Everything is very eas easily uh, understood and everything is well separated. Can we apply the same approach to having a layered architecture in our microservices? And the answer is yes. Basically, we can separate our microservices in layers and have this same this absolutely same ide ideology, absolutely same approach in a big microservice architecture with 4,000 microservices. Okay, but, but why do we want to do it? Why, why do we want to take this, this approach? And there are a couple of benefits. The first thing is that, first thing is that um, it gives us a common language. The same way that we all here in the room know what a presentation layer is, can be applied to our microservice architecture. When, you, when we speak to uh, the services in, in one of the layers, we know what those services are uh, supposed to do. And when we talk with each other, we can say, oh, I'm going to fetch data from this layer, and then I'm going to write it to this layer. It makes the architectural discussions very easy. easy. Another thing that um, gives us is a clear separation of concerns. We already discussed it. We know what should go where. where where if we want to add a new screen in the mobile app, I know which layers should change. If, we, if I want to change the way that we store uh, 
flying cars. We, I know where they should go. And um, it also gives us a consistent patterns. All the services in the same layer are built in relatively the same way. They have the same concerns. So yeah, you can, when you're building a serv service in some layer, you can just look around you and see what the other services in your layer does, and you, you can reuse the same patterns. And it's very easy to, it's very intuitive um, how to discover the APIs and the functionality um, that you need. It's very easy to understand where it is. You know where to look for your SQL code in your project. You know where to look for your HTML views in, in your MVC application, right? The same thing. If I, if I need uh, to find the functionality that, uh, for example, moves money, I know what, which layer it should be. And I know where to look at it. So it's very easy to discover where things are when you have layers. And this all contributes to the velocity of our engineering teams. Um, people can have a common language. They know where things are. They can reuse patterns. They can easily discover things. And this me makes the overall engineering team more and more efficient. And when you have a layered ar architecture, there are a couple of principles. So the services that are down in the architecture, they are more and more generic. As, as uh, yeah, when we go up the layers, the services become more and more specific to a specific use case. And yeah, um, the, and the layers have names. I missed one slide. Right. Yeah, and the services in, in the bottom, when something crashes in the services in the bottom, they break everything. But when, when we move up the stack, if something breaks, it breaks something more and more specific. So it's also a guidance that we can use. And uh, we can have names for our layers. These are four names that are just picked for this architecture. Presentation layer, LOB layer, business infrastructure layer, and a core layer. And they can have names like this, or they can have like other names. Like, for example, in meetup.com, this is the name of the layers that they have. There is one layer called rocks, and one layer called clay, and the clay things, things are built on top of the rocks. Yeah, which is also intuitive. <coughs> and um, yeah, you can have other names. And um, in order to understand, to tell you how this uh, architecture works, we can walk through the layers. So the presentation layer, everything in the presentation layer is, is responsible for presenting data. And uh, we have two services. One is a service for talking to our web APIs, and another service that's talking to our mobile clients. There are two separate services because they use different protocols, they have different concerns, they have different types of the way that the interaction happens with the clients. Then we have the LOB layer, where uh, the logic that is just specific for one line of business lives. So there's one service for rights, one service for Aravate, one service for EATS. And then there is a business infrastructure layer, where, where we can find the infrastructure that is common for all the layers above. So every line of business needs to have pricing. They all need to calculate taxes and everything. And at the bottom, we have uh, our, core, our core layer, where uh, we store the core data. And these are the services that basically keeps the data that all the other services above them uh, works with. And in order to have a clear layers, it's very important to have a clear API between the layers. Um, and you can do it with a different solution. You can do it with Protobuf, with Apache Tree, with GraphQL. But you need to have a definition of the layer. And when you have a layered architecture, the API become, becomes more and more important. And what is the end, the end result? We have this layered architecture when it's easy to find thing, things. It's multi-tenant. It's easy to mock new data and to test stuff. It's built with abstract platforms that very easily support new use cases. And it has a common data model, so everything can fit together and be integrated together and work as one, one uh, holistic system. So if we go to the first thing that we started, if we want to add Elevate as a new line of business that we need to support, we know that we need to create one service that is responsible for um, Elevate. We know that we need to put it on an LOB layer, 
we know how to integrate with the layers below because we know how the other the rights services integrated with the layers below we can reuse the same approach the business logic lives there we know how to reuse code and the system becomes a lot easy to understand and a lot easy to change so yeah thank you this was everything for me and i would yeah like some questions for Okay, we have five minutes for questions. If you want to ask Nikki anything, please approach any of the microphones in the middle. So, yep. Hi, uh, first of all, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I have a question about the, um, the testing with the multi-tenancy. Mm -hmm. So, you still, you, so I, I guess I missed something, but if you, if you deploy, um, a code that you want to test on a production environment, mm -hmm. even though um, you, you test with uh, the testing data set, you'd st you still might introduce business logic bugs for, for the yeah. real data, right? So yeah. I guess there is something that... Uh, yeah. Very, yeah, very good point. Yeah, you can still break your code <laughs> and you, can, yeah, you, you still need to have something to say, well, this new code only processes test tenancy data and the way that we do it is with experiments. Every new piece of functionality, we got it with feature flags. And then we say this feature flag is on if this experiment is true. And it's like A-B test. You go to the A-B system and you say, well, this test is true only for test NC traffic. And you can, you can yeah, make it even more concrete. Test NC traffic in uh, Paris, for example. Yeah, with A-B test, you control your feature toggle, your feature switch, and then your feature switch only works for test and traffic. Yeah, but great point. Hi, Nikki. Thanks for sharing your experience. It was a good talk. Uh, one follow-up to that question, actually, regarding your testing, because you say due to the large amount of services you have, you are not really preparing a staging environment. And with the multi-tenancy way of approaching it, it could work, but not for everything. Yeah. Can you share how you do load or stress testing, for example? Yeah, yeah. Stress testing is something that, because you know you don't have a staging environment in production environment, um, test, test traffic, testing tenancy traffic is a great way to do performance testing. Um, and yeah, we. We do, we do it all the time. Uh, every Thursday, we run a stress test on the whole system. And yeah, it's with more, in most of the services, this is like test tenancy traffic that we just, um, yeah, we just, you just, just do a load test. Um, if you don't have testing tenancy, it becomes a little bit harder to do it um, because it's very hard to do it without having user impact. For example, if you want to test um, your whole system, one thing that you can do is, just turn off the dispatch component, to, to turn the connection between the dispatch component and the trip service off. You say that it's, you, you saw that it's like a Kafka topic, right? And you just stop consuming. You write a lot, a lot of information in the Kafka topic, then you turn on the consumption and the rest of the system starts to consume the data with full throttle, right? But this impacts the user. If it's not test tenancy data, it's going to impact your real users. And um, yeah, you, yeah, that they're going to experience a delay in their money movements, everything. So yeah, the fastest, the, the safest way to test your production environment for stress test, and there is no need to, yeah, if you don't test your production environment with stress test, it's like you don't test anything. You cannot have a separate environment that you test. You need to test your production system. Now, yeah, and you also want to test it with failovers and stress tests and all different cases. You don't, if you don't do it with testing tenancy, you risk impacting people in the real world. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Hi, uh, my question is kind of generic, but uh, how do you know or when is the right time to break monolith into microservices? Because currently I'm working with a team and we're working on a huge monolith app that grows every day 
and we are always kind of wondering or tempted to break into microservices, but the question is, so nobody of us is kind of uh, experienced with microservices. Mm -hmm. So we are kind of wanting to, to migrate, but we are not experienced to, so what do we do? Yeah, um, you need to know why you want to migrate. You need to have a certain reason to do it. And if you don't have a reason, there is just too much complexity involved with managing microservices that you, it's better to avoid. For example, if you, if, when you have an outage, right, when you introduce a bug and it impacts real users, you have an outage, then when you analyze the outage and you say, well, it, it broke, the code broke because it's so risky to introduce new changes, um, because there, there's a lot of stuff that's happening here, it's hard to, to test everything, maybe, a reason, one way to do it is to break, break it into smaller components that are like uh, easy to damage control and to deploy separately. If, for example, you're saying like, well, the code base is too big and it's like very messy to have one such big piece of code, then, then it's a time to move. But don't do it if you don't have a reason. If you have a monolith, it's scaling well. You don't have outages related to the size of the projects. It's easy to, to extend it. It's easy to, to support it. It's well tested. Don't, don't go with, micro, with microservices. When you, something breaks in production, you know, oh, did this breaks, how to mitigate it. Let's, let's separate it in two. Yeah. Did, you, need to, you need to have a reason. Don't do it just for the sake of doing it because it's popular. OK. OK, thank you, guys. Uh, let's give Nikki a round of applause.